Good morning, everybody. I am Lizzie Steers with the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you to the very first Winter Wander Virtual Festival. It's presented by the National Park Service, Boston Harbor Now, and the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. We are so thrilled to have you join us and excited to bring you two full days of fabulous presentations. For a full schedule, check out our Eventbrite or Facebook pages, and the links are going to be in the chat. So we want to take a moment to really thank all of our wonderful presenters and partners for their time and effort in making this virtual festival a reality. Our kickoff presentation is titled, How It Started and How It's Going, From the Boston Harbor Cleanup to a Climate Ready Harbor. How did, the, how did the Boston Harbor go from one of the dirtiest harbors in the United States to one of the cleanest? What, and what changes the result? And how are planners preparing for the next chapter in Boston Harbor's waterfront and parks? This presentation walks us through the history of the harbor cleanup and offers tips for real life exploration and ways to get involved in the planning efforts. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter, Alice Brown. Alice is Boston Harbor Now's Chief of Policy and Planning. Her work primarily focuses on activating and improving public spaces and expanding mobility along Boston's harbor. You may find her around the city riding her bike, leading a tour, or looking for a way to experience international travel without boarding an airplane. We're going to save questions until the end of the presentation, but if you see along the bottom of your Zoom window, there should be a little button that says Q&A. Feel free to add your questions into that portal at any point throughout the presentation, and you can also type them into the chat. All right, Alice, the, uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Lizzie. Uh, apparently muted, now we're fixed. Um, I'm gonna be sharing my screen and for me, it's on an external monitor over here. So I might do this and that's why I'm not looking out the window. I'm checking out the slides to make sure things are working well. I'm really excited that all of you are here this morning. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the evolution of Boston Harbor and just like the popular meme, how it started, how it's going, I'll be talking through a few major changes on the harbor and relate it to our present time as well as to future plans. We'll touch on tides, and landfilling, the harbor cleanup, the creation of the harbor walk, and preparing for sea level rise, which is part of the moment that we're in right now. Before we get to the 20th and 21st centuries, I want to pause and go back to the early 17th century and acknowledge that Boston Harbor is surrounded by the unceded lands of the Wampanoag, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket people. When Europeans arrived in Boston and Charlestown, these places were known as Shawmut and Mishawam, respectively. Archaeological evidence like the shell middens on Grape Island and the remains of a fish weir found in Boston Common, as well as oral histories, offer clues to how the indigenous people used the area, including the waterfront and the harbor islands for more than 10,000 years, particularly relying on the bountiful fishing that was available. There are many, many places to start a story about the past, and I want to recognize that Boston Harbor had a long story before the English speaking one. I also want to tell you a little bit about Boston Harbor Now, the organization where I work and one of the organizers of this event. Our organization focuses really heavily on ensuring that people have access to the waterfront today. Some of that is about having equitable access to the waterfront, that it feels welcoming to people regardless of their age or race or ability. Um, and we also want to ensure that the harbor is ready for the future, that it's prepared for climate change and all of its impacts. It's resilient, it can bounce back, it's ready to go. And we do that, like I said, all along the Boston waterfront, the water sheets and sort of the surface of the water itself, as well as the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, which is um, part of why we're partnering with DCR and NPS today, and we're thrilled to be doing that. Um, we do that through public programming, we do our work through policy, writing comment letters and affecting legislation, and then also through doing plans. So in my work, I've done plans for the uh, water transportation, for Pedix Island, um, and other parts of the city of Boston. So before I um, dive in further, there are sort of two things I want to do. First, I would love for people to put in, I think if you can do the chat or if you can use um, the Q&A, give us a sense of where people are coming from today. I would love to make sure that I'm presenting to people. If you're 
you know, in Montana, I will give a slightly different presentation than if you are calling in from Quincy. So um, feel free to send us places you're coming from. I see Hull, Philly, New Mexico, Boston, Somerville, Cape Cod, more Charlestown, California, Troy, Dublin, Ireland, wow. Montana, Somerville, Salem, Brighton, Cleveland, Ohio, Lawrence and Roslindale, South Carolina. Okay, great, whole, whole range of things. People from Louisville, New York, I love it. Um, this is really good context. So I'll try to balance some far away and some close to home. Um, I'm glad I've got so many people from Hull. In my role as the chief of planning and policy, I often get to spend a lot of time on the harbor, which is great. Um, but I also get to understand what happened in the past and balance that out with understanding how to contextualize the future. I think one of the big takeaways that I hope you guys get today and that I have definitely experienced repeatedly is that a lot of things have changed on Boston Harbor, but we're never gonna to get to a point where we're like, okay, this is Boston Harbor. Things are gonna to continue to change and we have to figure out how to prepare for that. So with that, how it started and how it's going. To start, when the Europeans were arriving, um, they found two things that made Boston Harbor incredibly appealing when they arrived, the tides and the protection. If you're sailing across the Atlantic Ocean at, or up and down the coast of what we now call the United States and Canada, you would have encountered places that were really dangerous to moor your boat or drop anchor and wait things out. You wanna find a nice protected area where you can put your ships. And Boston Harbor is the ultimate protected harbor. Um, it offers a lot of perks, including the fact that there are some nice features that protect it from the tides and, or not from the tides, from the waves of the outside ocean. One of those is what I call the huggy arms. So if you live here, you're familiar with the town of Winthrop to the north and the town of Hull to the south. And I might be going backwards this way, um, but you know that there are two sets of communities that sort of reach out and hug the harbor. And that protects the harbor really well from major storms. In between, there are also a lot of islands and those harbor islands also bear the brunt of the storm. And so if you were arriving in the um, 1600s or 1700s, you just sort of appreciated that this was a really protected harbor and a great place to bring a ship. Today, we actually can quantify the benefits of that kind of protection. So the teams at the Woods Hole Group and UMass Boston have actually modeled the benefits of this natural protection. And through their research, they've determined that if you're out on the Atlantic Ocean, just outside of those areas, whether you're in Revere or you're in Situate, you are in places where you can see 17 to 20 foot waves on a really stormy day. And I would guess that today, despite the fact that we're ahead of the upcoming nor'easter, that you're seeing huge waves out on the Atlantic Ocean. But by the time those waves come through the harbor, they come filtered through the islands, they bump up against Hull and Winthrop, they're actually much smaller waves. So the biggest waves you'll see in Boston Harbor, even when there's that extreme storm further away, is only three to four feet. So we're gonna get talk later about the value that that provides for us preparing for climate change and sea level rise. But we're also going to talk about the fact that it's really valuable for the Boston city of Boston to develop as a port. Um, it makes it one of the most valuable ports on the whole Eastern seaboard. The other thing that's really nice about Boston is that we have really big tidal changes. Um, it's great if you're designing a city pre-modern plumbing to have a way to flush all of the waste that your community produces. And in Boston, we have that benefit. The Boston tidal range averages about 10 and a half feet. If you were to go out onto the harbor today around noon, the water would be about, um, you can see here, a little, almost 11 feet high relative to a, a sort of static base. Um, and if you were to go out around 6.30 this evening for an evening walk, it would be almost 11 feet lower. So you have this huge range of tides every day. And if you've been to the beach, you sort of see it gradually on the beach, but in the inner part of Boston, you can actually see it on the seawall, that huge amount of tidal change. Um, so it's great for flushing all of your waste out of the city. Anything that you put in at high tide goes out with the low tide. Great, but it is a problem for ships for a long time. 
Um, it means that when you come to the harbor, you can't necessarily pull right up to the shoreline because you have to be aware that the water could flush out again. So you actually have to drop anchor a little ways offshore. Um, but Boston Harbor, really good at fixing that. Um, here we are with the creation of Long Wharf, a wharf you can still visit in Boston. By creating long wharves and piers out into the water, Boston, early Bostonians solved the problem of what to do with this tide relative to the ships that they wanted to bring into this nice protected harbor. And so you can see here, um, Long Wharf lets you come all the way out and then you can pull boats up the same way that you pull up to the curb. It's way easier, obviously, to load your car with lots of groceries next to the curb rather than, you know, if you have to schlep them on the subway, which, you know, is still how a lot of people do things in cities. Um, the other thing that early Bostonians noticed and that they wanted to solve for was that they saw, hmm, at low tide, we see these salt marshes and mud flats and these areas that suddenly appear, but at high tide, they disappear again. And Boston re Bostonians realized they could expand the size of their city if they just filled in some of that land and reclaimed it from the ocean. So in some cases, they were using a certain amount of junk, but it wasn't a landfill the way we would think of a landfill today, but it was land filling. Sometimes they were pulling in dirt um, from local hills. Sometimes they were bringing it eventually by train. And so everything that you see in dark green here is original Boston landmass. And everything that you see in light green here was filled in at some point over the subsequent 365 years. Some of that land is well above sea level. They were sort of predicting, you know, let's just build up to match the existing terrain or, you know, even build it a little higher. And they've elevated specific sections of the city over time. But there are some parts that were really built to be higher than high tide whenever it was built, whether that was in the 1700s or 1800s, and those areas are now especially vulnerable, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, before we get to sea level rise, let's go back to this problem of the tides. People are dumping sewage into the water, and by the 1960s, we're in a place where uh, the, the harbor communities, about 64 communities, are taking their waste and they're concentrating it into just a couple places and they're processing it a little bit. So they're making sure that like, you know, some of the things don't go all the way out into the ocean, but they're still relying really heavily on the tidal flushing to sort of clean the harbor. And that's become less and less effective over time as we put more and more things into our waste stream. That includes things like plastic tampon applicators, large amounts of toilet paper, and all of these things are starting to gradually build up on Boston's beaches. It's pretty gross. In addition, we still have a little bit of our historic shipping industry. It had dropped off really significantly after World War II. So there are fewer and fewer places along the harbor that are either building or repairing ships, but where they are doing that, there's sort of a sheen of oil across the water. They're not really keeping track of um, the, the waste products of, of the work that they're doing. And if you were a longshoreman and you were used to unloading ships, you're noticing changes in how goods come to Boston. Instead of moving packages off of ships and onto shore, you're more likely to, to see containerized ships arriving. And so all of the shipping goes from these many, many wharves and piers, many of which you can see here in East Boston and the seaport. For those of you who don't live here, this is East Boston. This is the seaport. This is downtown. All of those ships are stopping, are no longer coming to downtown Boston. And they're coming to this area down here, off, slightly off screen, which we now call the Conley Shipping Terminal. So if you're living in Boston, the harbor is gross, the harbor front jobs are going away, and it's not exactly an exciting time for the harbor. But in 1972, United States passes the Clean Water Act, which should have instantly cleaned everything up, but obviously it takes time for different communities to catch up with what that means. There was no standardized or systemized way for um, the cleanups of different communities to occur. And um, it took some time and some legal action to address this. Boston Harbor at this point is being polluted by the sewage as well as by pesticides and by heavy metals. And the people of Quincy in particular decide that this is not okay. Their beaches are gross, it smells bad, and they begin to advocate for change. Um, the Conservation Law Foundation, which is a nonprofit that still exists today, 
brought a legal suit in the matter. And in 1984, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts passed a new enabling act. It created the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, which I'll call the MWRA. The creation of the MWRA meant that they had to create a system where people paid a certain amount for their water and for their water treatment. It consolidated all of that and made two major facilities. Whoop. One of those is the Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. The Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant shown here can process up to 200 million gallons of sewage per day as well as additional pumping and processing that happens on Nut Island in Quincy. If you're not from here, Quincy, by the way, is this sound city immediately to the south of Boston. Today, wastewater is cleaned so thoroughly that it is practically safe to drink, but it isn't just pumped straight out into the harbor. It goes through a nine mile long outfall pipe. And that outfall pipe for the last mile has these little diffusers that sort of spritz the water out. So it's not even coming out in one place. It's sort of gradually coming out over that mile stretch way offshore. And simply by cleaning up all of that sewage so that it wasn't being dumped directly into the harbor, Boston Harbor is actually able to heal itself pretty naturally. So it, it starts to the water, there's that tidal flushing process that began at the beginning, returns again. There's a lot less for the tides to need to flush out. And there's some more additional work that needs to be done to physically remove some of the debris in the harbor. That's ongoing today, whether that's like a piling that pops up and floats away or something falls off a ship or there's just sort of trash that blows into the harbor. There is ongoing cleanup that needs to be done, but it's so minimal compared to what was being dealt with before. If there's a really major storm, there's a couple outfall places where there might be bacteria in the water that would close a beach for a day. But by and large, Boston Harbor is now one of the cleanest urban harbors in all of North America. The beaches are safe to swim at and there's ratings and most of them get A grades really, really consistently. It's a really great success story. At the same time that this cleanup was happening, people who worked for the city, particularly for what was then called the Boston Redevelopment Authority and other city planners, they say, you know, if the harbor is going to get cleaner and if we have all these empty wharves, we can anticipate that there's going to be new waterfront development. It was pretty far sighted in the 1980s, but it's pretty common practice now that these cities that had turned their back on the water are sort of starting to return to the water. And if you travel to any global coastal city, you'll see this happening. So in Boston, they said, you know, we could have this entirely privatized waterfront as new development pops up. How can we protect for the future and make sure that this clean harbor is accessible to everyone? And they looked at something called the Colonial Ordinances of 1636, which gave Boston, actually everyone in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, not just Bostonians, they gave them the right to fish, fowl, and navigate. But modern lawmakers and regulators saw that and said, you know, we can use that in this thing called Chapter 91, it's a law, to ensure that the public continues to have access to the waterfront. And the city of Boston said, whenever you build something on the water, if you don't have a water dependent use, if you're not actually you know, a shipping facility or a fisherman, or you're not really interacting with the hot water directly, you're just a private development building, a residential building or a, you know, a shopping a place to shop or a place to eat, then you actually have to provide a set of public access and other public amenities. So they proposed something called the Harbor Walk that would create this 12 foot wide path that was always accessible to the public. And they also said you have to build install other things. You might have to install public restrooms or a water taxi dock or those binoculars that let you look out and magnify things across the ocean. Today, Boston has over 43 miles of waterfront pathway as a result of this. Some of it's in public parks that are owned by um, our state parks department, DCR, one of the sponsors of today's event. And some of them parks or waterfront are owned by private entities, but they have to provide that public access. And wherever you're on the Harbor Walk, you'll see one of, whoop, slide my mouse over here, slide my mouse. Um, one of these blue signs that tells you that you are on the Harbor Walk, it is open to the public and you are welcome to be there. So another set of great planning that happened. Um, this harbor walk though is in some places right at sea level. And so we need to make sure that we're preparing for that and that we're making it feel open and accessible to all members of the public. So jumping back in time again, how it started. Back in 1985, the Boston Globe did a special section about this harbor walk concept, about all the changes coming, about the creation of the MWRA. All of this was big news in the mid 1980s. 
but tucked under a map of places where the, there was you know, contamination in the harbor, which was of course still polluted at the time. There was a small article talking about the scientists that are studying sea level rise. And they said in the article, over the next year, sorry, over the next 30 to 40 years, um, there will be about a foot of sea level rise. And you know what? We are in that 35 year, right between that 30 and 40 year range past that 1985 article. And there has been about a foot of sea level rise. Again, because of our tides, we don't see it every day. We don't say, because we some days it's a nine foot tide and some days it's a 10 foot tide and some days it's an 11 foot tide, but our mean average high tide has gone up that much. Um, the article went on to predict that there might be three to five feet of sea level rise over the next hundred years. And we're currently projecting about 40 inches of additional sea level rise in the next 50. So all of those projections have actually remained fairly steady. And we, we knew about them. Um, but it's hard to take action about like a foot of sea level rise in the 1980s when it's a big deal just to clean up the harbor. So it took some time for Boston to catch up and say, hmm, we need to actually start designing things really differently. Superstorm Sandy, which hit New York City in 2012, was a wake up call for Boston. It didn't really affect Boston for two major reasons. One, thanks to the very big huggy arm of Cape Cod, the storm was a lot less intense by the time it reached the Boston area. Also, the worst of the storm arrived at low tide. And so when it's low tide, the harbor can actually absorb a lot of that extra water. And so there wasn't a noticeable change. But locals said, what if, whether it's advocates or city folks or state folks, everyone said, Hmm, Superstorm Sandy, what if it had hit at high tide in Boston? What would that have looked like? And that kicked off a whole bunch of things that are still happening today. <coughs> Excuse me. Starting in 2014, there was a series of design competitions and exhibitions. This one called Sea Level Rise looked at storm surge projections and what could happen with flooding. One thing to note about this model is that it literally looked at where the elevation of the land was below a certain point and said, you know, what if we're adding all of this extra water to the harbor and it filled in all of those spaces. In fact, later data models, which I'll be showing you in a second, suggest that there are plenty of places where there are different landforms that will keep the water out. So this is not an accurate map of where flooding will occur, but it was great as an intellectual start to having the conversation. In 2016, the city of Boston kicked off a process that is still going on today, but the very first thing was called Climate Ready Boston, and it created some general parameters for planning for a variety of climate issues. That includes sea level rise, as well as an increase in extreme storms, and we're becoming increasingly aware of something that is less relevant on the harbor, but very important to the city and the region as a whole, which are heat island effects, places where there's not a lot of trees, there's a lot of paved surfaces, and where it's getting incredibly hot in the summer, such so that eventually, Boston in the summer could feel like what's now Atlanta in the summer and Bostonians and their physical building stock are not prepared for that. Um, after that general plan, there were plans for different neighborhoods. So the first of those was a 2017 plan that looked particularly at East Boston, parts of East Boston and parts of Charlestown. Those are two waterfront neighborhoods. And in East Boston, they looked at flood pathways and said, you know, where is the water likely to come in? So, you know, this is a place where water is pretty, the land is pretty high. There was already land here before the neighborhood was filled in. But these two dark arrows in particular show that there's water that's going to come in and go up this thing, which is a former rail line that's now a greenway. Um, the plan led to some suggestions for ways to address that. And you'll see here, there's something that says a greenway flood wall, it's kind of small. But this design for a greenway flood wall, changing the greenway entrance and addressing flooding along the greenway in general, prompted a couple things to start happening. One of those was this uh, actual flood wall. So now when we know that there's going to be a significant amount of flooding, I don't know that it will happen um, for the upcoming storm that we anticipate arriving this weekend or at the end of this weekend. But if there's predict predictions or projections of really extreme flooding, um, the city of Boston can go out and deploy these barriers that allow to that prevent flooding along that greenway. Um, there are also things, if I go back a slide, you'll see that there are these little sort of dotted green areas along the shoreline. And the idea is that you can absorb some of the energy of storms by building modern um, created wetlands. And one place that's being done, you can see here, 
is out at the end of a building that's called Clipper Ship Wharf. So if you live in the Boston area, this is really close um, to the Maverick T station out on the water. And at low tide, you can see all of these like, you know, rock outcroppings and, um, and planted grasses. And all of that's been designed and reincorporated into the site to try to recreate the wetlands that used to be there before. So these are two different strategies that are um, particularly useful in the near term and can also be incorporated into larger long-term strategies moving forward. Um, but 2018 was the time that Boston really realized that they needed to be preparing for things and treat the tides differently. Um, in March of 2018, there was a major storm that brought flooding onto Long Wharf. So I remember way back to an early slide that had that Long Wharf that stuck out into the water. It's still there today. Um, and this whole distance is about a, a sixth of a mile from the flagpole out at the end. Um, normally there is some high tide flooding down here, but this amount of flooding, you can see the sandbags in front of the train station. This is probably two feet of standing water on a major roadway. This made Bostonians really aware that we had to address these flood pathways, these places where water could come in through these low, eleva um, low elevation areas. Um, and there are districts in the city where we can't just put in that one flood wall like you saw in East Boston. This is the Seaport District. And all of these areas show places where with 40 inches of sea level rise or even nine inches of sea level rise, um, during a major storm, flood water can go into all of these areas. In places like this, it's not about stopping the water in one place. It's about creating a district level solution that can, that can prevent um, this kind of flooding, determining what, um, which parts of the whole, like whole roadways can be developed, be raised or whole sites can be raised to create um, broader protection for this entire district. Also in 2018, the city of Boston put out a vision for what they called resilient Boston Harbor. And resilient Boston Harbor says, you know, we can't, we can, there are places where we can address it in these point to point ways, but how can we think more broadly about building really great systems of parks and harbor walks that are elevated Sometimes they may go into the water with those wetlands like I described earlier. What would it look like? Um, so it, again, it's a pretty broad vision without some of the super specific details, but those individual neighborhood climate plans have suggestions for how to create these coastlines that are better prepared for sea level rise. Um, I wanna talk a little bit just briefly about what some of the sea level rise looks like. Um, if we were to have an additional three feet relative to what we have today, High tide in Boston in 2070 could look like this. So if you don't live here, and I've been talking about these places, this neighborhood here is East Boston. It's home of Logan Airport, our major international airport. This is the Charlestown neighborhood where I'm actually broadcasting from today. Um, this is downtown Boston, and this is what we now call the seaport. So you can see the seaport is particularly vulnerable in lots of places, while there's just a couple places that water is going to enter into East Boston. And obviously by 2070, we hope to have most of these issues addressed. So there's one problem, which is just addressing high tides. Um, another issue is if you have what's called a 10% annual chance storm. So that means that in any given decade, once a decade, you're likely to have a storm that's just a little bit bigger. And with that kind of storm, you can see that there is a lot more flooding. And then there's a once in 100 chance storm, a 1% annual chance storm, which is sort of the storm of the century. And you've obviously seen storm of the century almost wherever you live. There's some big blizzard or some big um, hurricane, or in some cases, some big drought, you know, less rain than you'd ever expect. It happens once in a century. And some of those once in a century storms are happening seemingly multiple times a decade, um, largely due to um, climate change in general. So there's preparing for sea level rise, and then there's also about preparing for these major storms. And if you can see on this map, there are many parts of Boston that if they're not protected, could flood and make it look a lot more like the Boston we saw in that early slide where you can see all the land filling. This is mostly happening in areas where there's that filled land. Again, this isn't something that's gonna come and sit in Boston for days at a time or that Boston will always be flooded. It's just going to flood if we're not prepared when there's a high tide and when there are those major, major storms. So, oops, I, this is a slide I pulled from a last year's show and realized it says 2020 still. Um, today in 2021, 
we have a really clean harbor. We have a mostly completed harbor walk. Um, the newest sections can feel very park-like and welcoming. Um, there's typically uh, grass and parks that go along with it, as well as places to stop and sit and enjoy the harbor. There's a few places that were built right at the beginning where the harbor walk's only about 10 feet wide, but by and large, the harbor walk is really broad and welcoming. Um, Conley Terminal is thriving. That's the place where we still ship all of our goods into the city of Boston. Um, it's being there's dredging happening in the harbor to accommodate large Panamax vessels. So we're seeing an uptick in the kinds of ships that can arrive here in Boston. Um, prior to the pandemic, the cruise terminal was getting more and more ships each year. That uh, part of the economy is likely going to change in the future, but um, it was a thriving part of our local economy. And as I mentioned, there are new renovated parks around the waterfront. If you are in the Boston area, then the North End Park called Langone and Pluffalo, and that is almost finished being reconstructed with a brand new harbor walk that will be out of the range of flooding for the next decade, or sorry, next half century or more, um, and has other strategies in place for when those big storms come to protect the park and the neighborhood behind it. There are a few places that we know that we really need to focus on preparing for climate change further. One of those is Long Wharf. So it's actually here in the bottom of this picture. Um, this is the end of Long Wharf. And this is a building called the Custom House. At low tide or on a you know, non-rainy day, this is all dry wharf pier, it's totally fine. But increasingly there's more and more flooding that happens on a regular basis on Long Wharf. So, um, this is all flood water around that chart house parking lot. There's the flagpole out at the end of Long Wharf. So you get flooding out at the very end, and then it also comes up through the storm drains in the middle of the wharf. So this is an area that Boston Harbor Now and the city of Boston, as well as others, are looking at finding solutions for um, in order to prepare for the future. Um, another place that people are focused on, again, Boston Harbor Now is involved, DCR is involved, the city of Boston is leading the design process. Um, this area down here, so this is downtown Boston, the seaport that I've talked about, and South Boston. Um, this neighborhood here is Dorchester, and this is Moakley Park. This is what Moakley Park looks like today. It's mostly sports fields, um, and some of it is really low elevation. So there are lots of times when water um, could come here and sit. Some of that comes from rainwater, but some of that comes um, during major storms from the harbor itself. And there's a proposal, a new design that's been done that puts a berm through here. So it elevates a large section of the park to prepare again for that future flooding um, and reconfigure some of the sports fields and create some other amenities so that the park is welcoming to a wider variety of uses. Um, as we reinforce and reimagine the shoreline of Boston and protect the Harbor Islands, we want to be sure that we've preserved the values we've established. We wanna make sure that it you know, public access is paramount, that it's a welcoming harbor to everyone. Um, as you've heard today, a lot has been accomplished. A lot of changes have taken place on Boston Harbor. I've given you an update on how it's going, but obviously there's more work to be done to prepare the harbor for the next generation. Thank you for joining us today. Oops. Thank you for joining us today on Zoom. We hope that you can join us on Boston Harbor in the future, and I'll stop there to answer questions. It looks like a couple have come in. I think Lizzie might pop back up to filter those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. That was fantastic. Um, so for our first question here, um, what materials were used to fill all of the lower elevation areas of Boston and where did they come from? Yeah, that um, there are a lot of answers to that. It very much depends on at what point in history Boston, uh, a part of Boston was filled. So the area around North Station if you're if you live in Boston, you could have been to North Station or you maybe have, have heard of TD Garden where the Celtics and the Bruins play. Um, we're adjacent to an area of the new city called Beacon Hill. And today it is a hill called Beacon Hill, but originally it was called Tri-Mount. There were three little hills there, tri three mountains. They were not mountains. Um, and they were all, they were scraped off. So Beacon Hill was lowered and the two little hills next to it were lowered and they literally like scraped dirt into the back of carts and horses moved it and they dumped it in. Um, they had the benefit of having a, a, a mill pond there. So they built a, a wall to, to process, to have water and use the tidal flow to mill all sorts of things from chocolate to grain to paint. Um, and so they were like, that had gotten sort of sludge, sludgy and filled in. So they just brought in the dirt to fill that. Um, 
over time, things have changed. The back bay is was literally a bay um, or a part of the bay that the water flowed into on a tidal basis. And they were building rail lines and they thought, you know, we can bring in dirt from other communities. And so they brought they brought in dirt from farther away. In places like East Boston, again, they could have brought in dirt, dirt like actual dirt from um, from other places by train, by horse cart, but they there was, you know, if you go along parts of the East Boston shoreline um, or along Chelsea Creek in particular, or if you, I've heard, have gone into a very old building in East Boston and you go in the basement, sometimes they were just throwing in debris, whether that was broken plates or glass, there's all sorts of things that got added to the fill. So it's not like, ooh, beautiful, clean dirt, but it's also not trash in the modern sense. Long answer, but hopefully that helps. No, great question and great answer. Um, one of our other questions is from Daniel. Um, so they remember reading somewhere about the mollusk populations in the harbors of New York being decimated by water pollution. And is there a similar story happening here in the Boston Harbor? Yeah, so in New York City, um, there's a design firm called Scape that has proposed oyster texture, sort of adding a lot of shellfish back to the harbor to provide benefits to um, to stop some of those big waves. Boston, uh, New York Harbor doesn't have quite the same huggy arm protection, so there can be much larger waves in New York. And so they're proposing reintroducing um, mussels and mollusks and other things, oysters, to that. Um, here in Boston, there was, the population was similarly decimated by a combination of fishing and then pollution. Um, there have been proposals to bring back some of the population, and there's actually a group that tries to reseed the harbor with oysters. But at, the, at this point in time, the Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife Department um, is really concerned that what might be reintroduced as a climate change or energy absorbing measure or just part of the ecosystem in general might be eaten by people. And it, the contaminants in the bottom, like what is the, the ocean floor? It's weird to think of the harbor being the ocean floor, but. Um, there are still contaminants in the dirt. And so we're not clear, it's not clear yet if oysters in Boston Harbor are edible or how often they're edible. And so we're in this funny place of like people wanting to reintroduce them, but being concerned they might not be healthy enough for human consumption. And that even if they're just introduced as a stopgap for you know storm protection, that they could be eaten by people who are just like wandering out on the beach and like, hey, I'm gonna take this home. So we're in a sort of tense place. Um, and hopefully that answers the crux of the question. Awesome, thank you. Um, for our next question, we're gonna, um, Robert Palmer asked to ask his live. Um, Robert, I've allowed you to uh, unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question. Let's see, okay, so we can do another question and then circle back to Robert if, uh, if they're still there. All right, so um, how does the city decide which flood risk areas to shore up first? Um, that's a great question. It, part of, right now, the city is mostly focused on places that we know that they know will flood the soonest. So that means that there are parts of East Boston um, and Long Wharf that they're really focused on figuring out how to address those. They're also doing long-term planning for different kinds of berms. So again, a berm, you probably know what a berm is generally, but the idea um, for a, from a climate change perspective is that you would build up some sort of concrete, um, long linear thing, and then you put dirt on it to make a nice pretty slope and hopefully it becomes more of like a park-like environment as opposed to building a wall. And they've proposed berms in a few different places. The berms actually provide more district level solutions. And there are three areas, one in East Boston, one along what's called the four point channel between downtown and South Boston, um, and then in Moakley Park that I mentioned earlier, all those places are areas where they can they can build those structures and that will do a lot of the work to protect the entire district rather than just one site. Um, if you are a new project in the city of Boston on the waterfront, you have all sorts of requirements for building a taller building and making sure that your ground floor area is floodable, that any kind of power sources are on the roof as opposed to the basement of the building. So there are things that individual building owners have to do and then there's stuff that the city is doing and planning on. Again, some of these changes are gonna take, happen gradually over time. Um, the Long Wharf flooding was 
looked catastrophic. It was, you know, mildly catastrophic and damaging. There was definitely damage to parts of the Blue Line Tunnel, but it wasn't as though the hotel or the restaurant that were there lost anything other than, you know, seven hours of business or four hours of business in the middle of the day. So um, while that too is a problem, we know that we're really planning for the future and not we can we can we can hopefully address most of these issues by the time they become pressing issues every day. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so our next question is: Do these newer plans for climate resilience around the harbor include making the parks and landscapes more biodiverse, as in less turf grass and single trees and more native plants? Um, that definitely varies by project. Um, there are definitely places in the city where. Uh, community members are really requesting different kinds of sports fields. And so many of those things will have to, you know, either be grass or artificial turf. But blended in with that are a lot of salt tolerant plantings, native species. Um, there's definitely a move to not plant things that have become um, invasive species. So we're really, we're cutting back on the invasive species for sure. And there are going to be places where we see really great plantings that you would come by and be like, this is a great solution in other places where I think we just have to address what the neighborhood needs and the recognition that there's a lot of, there's going to be heavy public use of a certain space. There's a pier in um, the Seaport District it's called Pier 4 that was recently built out and that has some really great examples of local and salt tolerant plantings, just like what you described, but there's also sort of a lawn that people can sit on and that's that's grass. So I think we're gonna we're gonna see a mix of those two things. Fantastic. Um, so you already touched on this a little bit, but um, what is the city of Boston's plan for keeping historic buildings safe from flooding? Yeah. Um, the it depends on where the historic building is located. Um, Faneuil Hall and Quincy Market are not necessarily being protected from sea level rise on site, but the I hope is that by protecting Long Wharf and keeping water out back at Long Wharf that you would then protect some of those historic buildings. In other places, it's about, um, there's a variety of flood proofing techniques that can be used. The city of Boston actually released, or well, the Boston, Redevelop Boston Planning and Development Agency released guidelines for protecting buildings. Um, so it sort of depends on where the building is and how historic it is and what it means. Um, you know, there's paints you can use on the outside of a concrete building, which could be you know, 50 or 60 years old at this point, you'd want to preserve that. But older brick structures have a whole other set of techniques. That makes sense. Um, so one of our questions from the chat is, do you know of anything that local high school students might be able to do to help out the Boston Harbor, whether it's to help flooding or generally keep the harbor clean? Um, that's a great question. There's a couple things I might suggest. Um, there's an organization called the Harbor Keepers in East Boston. So if you're local, I would suggest reaching out to the Harbor Keepers. They do, they organize a certain number of uh, cleanups a year. And they're also doing a lot of education around microplastics, which is the latest pollution problem in Boston Harbor. Um, plastics, whether they're flying out of um, trash cans or just blowing into the water from other sources. It's not that people are dumping their plastics into the harbor, but they sort of get eaten up over time. And, um, I think for a long time we were really focused on like those big plastic, you know, plastic bands that come around a set of cans or something and like getting wrapped up around sea turtles. There's fewer and fewer of those issues in Boston proper, but there are a lot of issues with these microplastics that get broken down and get really small. Um, so Harbor Keepers is actually leading a lot of great education programs and cleanups around that. So that's something to look into. And then I think just, you know, you can encourage high schoolers to get involved in um, planning in their neighborhoods. So if they live in Boston, in a Boston neighborhood or, you know, even surrounding communities, there's likely a plan that's happening for their neighborhood and they can attend public meetings and share their thoughts and speak up for um, adaptation strategies that will protect their future. Wonderful. And uh, Brittany just added the, their website into the chat. So feel free to go check them out directly if you'd like. Super. There are um, also National Park Service leads um, monthly cleanups out to the Harbor Islands. So Post pandemic, you can also join one of those and go out and clean up on one of the Harbor Islands or do plantings. There's a whole bunch of things that they do as for those volunteer days. Absolutely. Um, so our next question is, is the tidal range for Boston greater than other places along the East Coast? And if so, what factors contribute to that difference? That is um, my favorite question because I'm obsessed with tides in general and I'm really obsessed with them right now for a variety of like sort of adjacent to work reasons. Um, 
And I haven't found a great answer for exactly why Boston's tides are so high. Um, there are parts of Nova Scotia where there's even larger tidal ranges. And then I also know like Baltimore's inner harbor has like less than a foot of tidal range per day. Um, Baltimore's inner harbor though is like way up a river. So it doesn't have quite the same adjacency to the waterfront that, um, that Boston does. New York has less tidal range though. I don't know exactly what it is. And obviously there's different conditions on the East River versus the Hudson. You know, it's, it's a whole other set of conditions, but um, it does vary. And I used to think it was strictly based on its distance from, you know, further North places had more tidal change and further South places had less. Um, which is generally true, but not perfect. So none of that is the scientific answer, but yes, there's a huge amount of range in tidal ranges along the coast. Wonderful. Um, so our next one is, are the areas most likely to be flooded located in the areas that have also been fill or reclaimed over time? And would those be considered flood zones? Um, some of the flooding would occur uh, as occurring or could occur um, in areas that have been filled and others are just along historic rivers. So there are areas along the Neponset River um, that are likely to flood where there really wasn't filling. It's just like it was the Neponset River and the Neponset River where it is a tidal estuary, like it's beyond, um, to the east of the dam, um, the water, you know, the higher high tides are higher. So um, it's sometimes it's largely filled areas, but not exclusively filled areas. All right. So thank you so much, Alice. This was absolutely fantastic. So it was a wonderful presentation. Um, for those of you, if we did not get the chance to answer your questions, feel free to message or email the park either through the park email or on Facebook, and we'll do our best to answer those questions.